see. Come on and join us on a science fantasy. Welcome everybody to Musical Orbit's webinar, Flutes Around the World. Well, one flute in particular. We're joined today by Siobhan Greeley, who used to be uh, the second flautist of the London Symphony Orchestra, was also the principal flautist of the English Symphonia and a flautist of the Wakeford Ensemble. She's also one of the biggest names around London in the session world. Uh, but you actually, Siobhan, don't live anywhere near London, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I live up in East Lothian these days. In Scotland? Um, yes, Scotland. A little town just outside of Edinburgh on the coast. So um, what made you move and do the commute from hell? <laughs> well, surprisingly, the commute from here isn't too bad. I was amazed because when I moved up here, um, I still had three months of work with the LSO and I did commute it. I did buy lots of flights, cheap online, <laughs> train fares and all sorts of things. Um, but it isn't as bad as you would think, considering how terrible the train journeys can be in London sometimes. However, what brought us up here was um, my husband's job and our little boy, because um, he, was, he was quite small um, when we moved up. He was only two and a half. And when Steve was offered a job up here, he comes from Scotland. Um, we just looked at our lives and we thought, this is the right thing to do for the family. So we, we leapt really, rather than, I certainly didn't think about it. I just thought, I'm, I know this is the right thing to do. And so I think if I'd given myself much chance to think about it, it would have been a much harder decision to make and to actually work through the whole leaving and everything. But it took on a life of its own, house selling, house buying, the whole move. And, um, and, and that was it. So we did move up here for family reasons, really. Well done you. Um, Rachel sends in a question saying, do you miss your musical life in London? Now we know that you do still huge work in London, but do you, do you miss it being all on your doorstep like that? Um, I do. I really do miss that a lot. And people warned me um, that it would feel, um, it, it would be difficult, but you can't, I couldn't think about it at the time. And in fact, even when I first moved up here, it was a good six months before it start, I started to miss it. In fact, it wasn't the musical life at first I missed. Um, I, had, I was born in London, I went to school in London, I studied in London and I worked in London. And it wasn't until I moved up here and suddenly had no, no connections to London. I found myself standing on Waterloo Station concourse and bursting into tears with a rucksack on my back thinking, oh my word, I don't live here anymore. Um, so it was, it was really, that at first that I missed and it took quite a long time for the musical thing to kick in but I, I do miss it there's a lot going on up here but um, I miss I, I miss the NSO a lot um, I would be lying if I said otherwise <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a tough life though isn't it um, with an orchestra like that they work extremely hard they and do. Are, um, traveling a lot how many months yeah. a year do you think I think it isn't it actually a full four months away, but that is spread across every month. Yeah. So um, I think it's more that I was thinking about this this morning because I wondered if somebody might say that. You know, I, I went from um, d doing full time something that I, I dedicated my life to since I'd started playing the flute at eleven um, to not doing it as much as I had been doing, and and that is that's a big shock. You know, it's. Um, and, and the main focus of, of my life shifting to being about other people, people other than myself. Um, and so it, it, you do miss it. And I have days when I think, um, I, when I think, when I see them, you know, at the start, of they, they just did a long tour in America and all my friends were putting pictures up of themselves and having cocktails in New York. And I thought, oh, and then when I realized it was 18 days, you know, and <laughs> you think I, that, it just didn't fit with what I was, where I was in my life. Yeah. But um, I did, I did miss the LSO and my colleagues more than in a way I didn't anticipate and found myself sitting in other places playing pieces I placed, played with the LSO and being really emotional about it. And then I had a real breakthrough 
at Christmas, just, just the last Christmas just gone, I found myself sitting in a green room in Glasgow listening to um, the Enigma Variations on the Tannoy. And, and as um, one of my close colleagues in, in the Yellowstone, and a very dear friend, Sharon Williams, will um, testify, I am, was never a lover of Elgar. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the LSO changed that actually. Colin Davis changed that, and it was a really surreal thing. And, and I sat in that green room and I listened to them playing it, and I thought, I must I must be moving on because I think twelve months ago I would have had to have left the building. I couldn't even have listened to it because I would have been really over emotional. And and um, so yeah, I mean the short answer is there are aspects of it that I miss, but um, we have a great life up here. Yeah. You have to find the, the, the balance, don't you? Yes. The tricky yes. Um, Steve asks, how did you get involved in the London session scene? Now, this is a question we have quite often at Musical Orbit. It's quite a tricky one to get your foot in the door, isn't it? How, how did you get your foot in the door? Well, um, I got my foot in the door because um, prior to the LSO, I was a very busy London freelancer. That took a very long time to happen. <laughs> A really long time to happen because I was um, the grand old age of 40 when I got my job in the LSO <laughs> so um, and I got my first sessions with a big London session fixer because a principal flute was being asked who they wanted in the lineup next to them they were suddenly getting a lot of work themselves and I was one of their top choices to sit in the section um, almost immediately after that started happening I got my job in the LSO <laughs> and was no longer available but actually they they carried on asking and when I was on maternity leave they asked and when I um when I left the LSO they they asked and then they said what do you mean you've moved to Scotland <laughs> but essentially it was a uh, principal flute who appreciated my support next to them who got me in through one fixer and also um one of my best friends used to fix film sessions um uh, several years ago so I, I cut my teeth doing her sessions and learned a lot and then um, and then you also learn the ropes with other orchestras so when I was working with the London Philharmonic Orchestra we did a lot of the Lord of the Rings and and that was an education so by the time I got to the LSO um, who do a lot of sessions um, I I was fairly comfortable in that environment but for me it was my success as a freelancer as a as a down the line player that got that foot in the door what would be your top bit of a session advice to our followers um your top bit of advice for getting not getting the work be, getting the work already being in the session but keeping the work in the session um, um, my top bit of advice would be sit still stay quiet and say nothing very important and buy the cups of tea in the break as well yes yes do that quickly quickly and quietly and lots of them very good <laughs> it's all about the music yes <laughs> now we have um, another Siobhan here asking a question oh she said hello Siobhan <laughs> what age were you when you started playing and did you have a very good first teacher I was 11 I got given a flute for my 11th birthday by my dad and, and my mum and um, they had no idea I think really the truth is I was a James Galway phenomenon um, and I think I heard it on the on the radio and I must have thought that's the instrument for me I was already playing the piano and the recorder but I was given one for my 11th birthday and my first teacher was called Claire Brennan and she was a student at the Guildhall School of Music and I can remember <laughs> I can remember talking to her about that and she said she was studying to be a flute player and, and I, I can just remember thinking you mean you do this for all the time <laughs> yeah and from that moment I didn't want to do anything else right so you've been to school work and practice nine hours a day um no I was never a well you know you like a lot of people think they didn't do very much practice um, Claire was a, a lovely, a lovely teacher. Um, she, I, I think, had quite a lot on her hands with me. I wasn't the, I don't think I would have said I was the easiest student at school or, or anything else. Um, but I did practice. And then as I got progressed more, um, I actually dumped my academic lessons to practice at school. 
My family weren't musical at all. We had a piano at home, but nobody was musical. And the truth of the matter was I wasn't really, it was not at all popular when I played at home. So I, once I got to the stage where I was having to do um, enough practice to, to carry on, I did that in school. So I used to get into school, um, I used to get up really early and I used to get into school for between half past seven and eight o'clock in the morning and practice before lessons started. Um, there was one subject I wasn't particularly good at, um, coming up to my O-levels, which was the precursor for the younger ones of you than to the GCSEs. And, um, and I just, so I just dumped a subject and practiced for the time, that double period. And then when I got into A-levels, I just got into school at seven o'clock in the morning. And that was when I did my practice. Yeah, there's got to be some dedication there, really, doesn't there? Yeah, as much as I like to think I didn't do much practice, I suspect I probably did more than I thought. I think you probably did. <laughs> So Siobhan also asks, how important is the first teacher that you have? She says that their daughter is not happy with their, her first teacher, but she's not sure whether it's just the daughter being difficult or whether they should actually move her. Yeah. It really is that very initial grounding. I think that this is a really important question um, on, on two levels, because um, I, I can't answer the question about the teacher because I don't know the teacher and, and also I don't know your daughter. So... Um, but I can answer it from a personal perspective, both as a student and as a teacher and as a player. Obviously, it is really important that you um, are comfortable with your teacher. I always say to people um, who talk to me about it, and, and this is a particularly pertinent point at, at this point in my life, because um, I live outside of Edinburgh and quite a long way from, from the hub of music in Scotland. And... Um, when people say to me, oh, will you teach my, my child this instrument or that instrument? I think, no, I'm a flute player, you know. But to them, if you're a musician, you can teach any instrument you like. And I really feel it's very important that you get a specialist as soon as you can, if not from the start. Mm. So um, if you have found a specialist and, and, that, and that person is a good player and a good teacher with a, with a well-respected reputation, then um, it could be your daughter who's been difficult. But also I found a lot with, and I'm gonna face this with my own son, that in today's society, people want very much want a sort of a quick return for everything. And it's really hard to keep students motivated with the long goals that come with, with music practice. There are peaks, there are troughs, um, and, and that can be something that as a parent, you can make an enormous difference to your, ch difference to your child's progress if you are willing to help them through that and practice with them and work alongside the teacher to help their musical progress because learning a musical instrument doesn't happen overnight it's a it's a lifetime's pro you know progression um but a specialist teacher will make a huge difference if you have got somebody whose main focus is that one instrument then they will bring something to it that that um a broader spectrum teacher may not bring and also if you've been studying with a teacher for several years it can be that you reach a stage where the relationship isn't as functional as it might be or as productive and so it could be that it's time to move on so the arts could be that it depends how long she's been with the teacher what stage she's at and is it time to move on to a different level with that teacher yeah and there's also i think we can't underestimate the importance of the parent practicing with the child as you said yeah. even if the parent isn't musical at all it's very yes. important that you sit there, you take notes in the lesson of what the teacher's requiring and talk to the child about are they yes. doing what the teacher asks? Because a small child, it, it's a lot to ask. That, that it is a lot to ask, yeah. Going, yeah. It's a stressful thing. Uh, lovely. Um, Steve now has uh, come back with another question saying, um, do you meet other flautists from other orchestras when you travel around the world? Is it one, I think he's asking, is it one big social party? <laughs> little bit you know sniffy what are they like <laughs> well um i was about to say no you don't really but but you don't gen you generally don't meet other orchestras who are on tour at the same time because by definition you're all doing concerts in different places and um before i took the job in the lso i had worked with the lpo for 15 years um and i'd been at college with sue thomas who's in that section and stuart mcawan was a great friend of mine and and i said to stuart well look we'll still meet for drinks and he just turned around and said I went to college with June Scott. She's one of my oldest friends. She's resident in the festival hall at the same time. We never see each other. Okay, so. Um, so but the really nice thing um, is that a girl that I was at, at um, college with, 
um, when I studied. When I was on trial with the LSO, I came out of the Boston um, hall to find this girl waiting for me, you know, and, and it, it's quite funny because often you get, um, everybody wants to meet the principal players and they're all sort of, you know, and, and there's this girl shouting down the road after me. <laughs> and I, I was like, oh. Um, and she was over there getting her, she used to live in America, she's Australian, she's now in Australia, and um, she'd been to the concert and was waiting for me afterwards. So um, you do get to meet people around the world who um, you might otherwise never catch up with. And she's somebody who's since, well, she asked me if I would do some classes in Australia when the orchestra were over there last year, but I had already left by then. Um, and so you do get to meet friends that you've studied with and all of those sorts of things when you're visiting their hometowns. Um, and flute players are very, they are very sociable. I did a concert in Manchester last year with, with Catherine Baker with the Halle. We did Daphnis. And amazingly, I came out, um, and I'm glad I didn't know actually beforehand, but the place was mobbed with flute players, some of whom I hadn't seen for ages, you know, and that was really nice. And they were all sort of, I was running for a train or something, you know, ridiculous after the concert, but they were all waiting to speak to everyone. And, and that was really nice because they were all just very supportive and, and lovely about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it is sociable, but you don't always get to see people when you're traveling around. I mean, it's... You certainly don't meet the other orchestras when you're traveling around, except sometimes at airports when you're all coming back at the same time. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what the collective noun is for a, a load of flautists. Oh, I think you could probably... <laughs> answers for that one. Uh, so, Siobhan, where then in the world, I mean, you have been around the world many times. Yeah. Where's your favorite place? What's your favorite concert hall? More to the point, what's your favorite bar? I would have to say, the place I I miss the most, the opportunity to go regularly is New York. Oh, me too. I know. <laughs> There's an amazing margarita bar very near Avery Fisher Hall. I know. They're it's just... Pomegranate margaritas, amazing. I know. It's quite hard to get a bad cocktail anywhere in New York, isn't it? I mean, it just... Um, it really is such a great place. And I think I was given my job in New York as well, you know, and, and it just... Um, I, I loved it. I've got family in New York. The last time I went there on tour, we stayed afterwards for a few days and we went to go and um, we had a bit of a family holiday, actually. We took, I took the boys and um, so I really, that would be the one place I, if I could go back on tour. But funnily enough, the other place, and I was really surprised about that, that I regret that I'm, I don't have the opportunity for some time to go to is Japan. Um, I, I really love Japan. I think it's great. So, um, Japan grew on me. It, it took me a few years to get used to the food. Um, yes. But I have to say, it's changed a lot. Um, yes. I started touring there 20 years ago. It's a very different place now, I think. I think it's great. And it's such a beautiful country. And, um, and there's just so, so much, I don't know. I loved, I loved going there. And also, I have to say, I don't know if other orchestras are the same, but there were some amazing receptions when... <laughs> Very good at hospitality there. More champagne than I've seen almost anywhere else, actually. <laughs> but I, New York would be my number one place. And actually Paris. And we went to Paris a lot. And I love that. And, and you say about sort of, everyone used to moan about the hotel in Paris because it's right opposite the Gare du Nord. But actually, I used to love sitting my glass, sipping my glass of champagne and having a, you know, an omelette after the, after the show. It's great, actually. You can't beat that. I think it's brilliant. It's a hard life, yes. It is. <laughs> well, yeah. So you were um, a member of the flute section at the LSO for yes. years there, but before that, you were, even though you weren't a member, you worked a lot with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Yes. Did you find um, that there was a big difference in the style of playing from flute section to flute section, even though they were in the same city? Or did you find it was, there's a general British style? Um, I, think, I think there is a difference. Definitely, I think all the orchestras have their own style, and um, and there is there is a big difference. I mean, there's a sort of you always sitting in any London orchestra get a frisson of, excite, of, of excitement because it, it is exciting. It's an amazing feeling. In fact, sitting in any orchestra that's that's the bottom line. I I love it. You know, it doesn't matter where I'm sitting. You sit there and and it is exciting. And I mean, I've I've sat in all of the seats in all of the orchestras actually, funny enough. I mean, I did actually sit principal in the LSO once and, and I can remember Chi saying, there we go, that's that on your CV now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but in the other orchestras, I, I sat in all, all of the chairs and actually I get as much 
of a buzz sitting in the section. I always have done as, a, as sitting on, on the principal chair. For me, it was never about that sort of um, thing about being a principal player. And, and that's a really important quality in principal players, I think, that it is something that they are gifted to. But um, there is a real frisson. You sit in those um, seats and it's, and it's great. There's definitely a different sound between all the orchestras. And, um, and I found that uh, quite a big challenge and an adjustment. And, and the difference as well for the um, LSO job is that you've got two permanent principals who don't always, who are very different players. So at, in my job, you were always challenged depending on who it was who was on sitting next to you. Whereas in other orchestras, they have their principal player who may or may not be on, but there's a sort of accepted sound that you, you get used to sitting with. And in a way, it's more incumbent on the guest principal to, you know, it's a, it's a different skill. It's a different feeling. But um, there's definitely, I think all of the orchestras have their own sound and you do have to get used to that within your own section. But then going into a session then, you won't know until you turn up who's on that session, will you? No. So that, there must be some challenging times for you then if you turn up and think, I, I don't know you. Yes. You decide, um, and, you, and the red light goes on. Yeah. You have to, and you just that's right. for it and hope for the best? Or... No, I mean, it's, that's where, um, this is one of the great challenges for me about being a down the line player and, and having eventually specialised a lot in second playing. And, and I've done a bit of, of, of the classes on that sort of thing at, at the colleges. Because there are skills, there's set skills that you have as a second player or a down the line player that you don't need as a principal um, flute in the same way. They come from the same base, but you employ them like, you know, times a million when you're sitting down, down that section. And you do have to just be able to, the last session I did, I turned up and I mean, lucky me, it was Paul Edmund Davis on the principal chair. So that's hardly a struggle <laughs> and it was very nice. And, um, but I sat for an hour and a half cold doing nothing because I wasn't needed. Um, and then suddenly they said, actually, could, could the, I was playing third flute on that day. Um, could the third flute double the principal flute? And nothing else was going on. Now that is, you know, sort of, and I could see, you could see a whole, everybody in the section going, right, okay. <laughs> and actually it was fine, but you just have to, yeah, it's a skill set of, of being able to actually blend but support all at the same time and finding a way of sitting inside their sound but being strong enough to, to add something to it at the same time. Yeah. Um, we've got um, a question here from Rachel again. Um, what's the music scene like where you live now in East Lothian in Scotland? I mean, obviously very different from London, I'm sure. Uh, you've been here for years now. Um, how involved are you in it? Um, I'm not very involved in the scene up here and that's um, partly because it's um, when I moved up here it was a, an enormous change in life and it took a lot of I needed time to settle in up here and for the first six months I mean I had left the NSO I think I was after two months of commuting, but I had a couple of tired concerts. So it was six months. My last concert with the LSO was six months after I moved up here. And at that point, I, th I said to my husband, I need to say no to any work coming in from London and take six months to settle in up here because I was getting very homesick for life um, back down south. But, um, you know, I, I don't live near the music hub of Glasgow um, from what I can gather you know most of the music ha happens in Glasgow I don't live very far in fact I live closer in public transport terms to Glasgow than I lived to London when I was in the LSO but people don't travel very much to work here they all live quite close and I haven't really wanted to work that much having made the decision to um, come up here for family reasons my son doesn't start school until next year and so I've not um, I've not, I needed a break really from orchestral playing and I needed time to assimilate what I'd, I, what I'd done to my life and, and all the decisions I'd made. And, and I was really tired after five years um, schlepping around the world with the LSO, having had a baby and all of that. I, I really needed a break. Um, so I, and also having spent 
the largest part of my career freelancing, um, I certainly wouldn't expect anybody just to bend over backwards to get me in to work just because I denounced my rival up in Scotland. So I haven't really, I've just gone very slowly and um, they're, very, they're very friendly and they're very lovely and I do bits and pieces of work um, here and there which fit in around my life and I keep my hand in down in London. But I'm, I've not completely um, thrown myself into the music scene up here just yet. Um, classical music wise uh, there is an enormous like sort of folk music scene here and, and uh, the funny the funniest thing I find when I'm walking around and I'm talking to people and they say oh you know what what do you do and that's when I say I'm a musician where I live they'll go oh god not another one <laughs> <laughs> it's because um there's a massive folk scene on here and, and people so there's always folk stuff going on in all the pubs and there's a folk festival and all this sort of thing and and it is quite funny I have a little smile to myself because I would have said that 95% if not even 99% of the people who live where I live have never heard of the LSO that's good I mean they've got no it's quite bizarre you know and when I moved up here somebody said oh okay so you've left your orchestra what um what was it she said um Wait, uh, can, can you not just move up, upwards from that, you know, now that you're here? And I, <laughs> I just sort of laughed and I said, it's, it's more a sort of a sideways thing, maybe. I don't know. It was just, so they, it's a very different scene, absolutely, in my locality. The actual Scottish music scene, I'm taking my time because um, my move up here was about other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, if, you know, maybe one day you'll start accepting students in East Lothian. Maybe you'll start um, having a go at the folk scene yourself. I don't know. I used to I used to do a lot of folk singing when I was a kid because my family's Irish. So that was the only music that was in our house. Classical music was a complete sort of. In fact, my mum was. It, she still, she still says, she used to say to me regularly. I I, I look at you and I think, where did you come from? <laughs> no, because <she laughs> they don't. They just. It had no. It was never. I, no one in my family knew anything about it. It, it wasn't, nobody had heard any. It was just a complete, sh total shot out the dark, you know. We've got time for one last question. Okay. Um, it's rather a good one from Rachel, who uh, we, we know that you have a little son, uh, who is yes. four, five? Four, four and a half. Four and a half. Do you encourage him to play? And this is um, a big question for all musicians. Do you uh, oh, yes. take them down the same path or do you ward them off? <laughs> don't do it under any circumstances how do you feel um it is this is such a tough one I, I, what i'm doing next after this is his little piano lesson with a friend oh. and i'm teaching them the piano um i i really don't know where to begin with this one i want him to learn a musical instrument because of what it brings to your life um and actually you know, it's, it will be up to him what he does with his life. He's very, very, very sporty, even at four and a half. So I don't know. Um, at the, I suppose the answer to that is I am encouraging him because I'm, I'm giving him piano lessons. But um, I'm doing it because my friend's daughter really wanted them. And um, I thought, OK, so I'm doing them for free for her so that he is jealous enough to want to participate because of my attention and you know he's four and a half and I've um, researched and I'm, I've gone away and I've taught myself a whole Kadai method for for teaching which has been absolutely fantastic I'm loving it I'm really loving it but um uh so yes he's doing that he picked up a trombone at a little music thing and looked like a total natural so I don't know but up here I found it's quite different to London that's been the biggest thing when I moved up here I tried to get him uh, you know early years string lessons and everybody just looked at me in horror everyone I wrote to they all said oh no 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 I mean he, he, he's far too young maybe six or seven or maybe nine and I'm thinking you know in London you have to have them registered when you're pregnant never mind at nine <laughs> <laughs> so I have really struggled to find any local teachers who are interested in in giving him any musical education at all at this stage so I've, I've started it myself there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Siobhan, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to learn with Siobhan online or in East Lothian, we're now able to offer on-location lessons. Uh, please do come to musicalorbit.com. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
through the galaxy. 